Welcome to the Strong for Performance podcast, where we give coaches and consultants practical ideas for taking you to the next level in your business and in your life. I'm your host, Meredith Bell. I interview experts who've walked in your shoes and offer real world experience that you can apply to your own journey. Welcome back to another episode of the Strong for Performance podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and today I'm delighted to welcome to my program, Terry Earthwind Nichols. Terry, welcome to my program. I'm very honored and excited to be here, Meredith. Well, I can hardly wait for us to get started, but first I'll give some background on Terry. Terry and I first met uh, on LinkedIn and have had a number of conversations and became fast friends. And he is just a fascinating person. I know that my listeners are really going to enjoy our conversation today. Terry is the chairman of Evolutionary Healer. And this is a global transformational performance improvement company. Terry is unique. He created and uses with his clients a process called repetitive behavior cellular regression to help them stop destructive behavior patterns so they can lead more productive and successful lives. And it's just fascinating um, to learn about that process. How he got there is interesting, and he's going to tell us more about that, but Terry has just a fascinating background. He spent 20 years with the U.S. military, excuse me, the U.S. Navy, and was a, uh, an award-winning recruiter for them. He's also worked in other areas that are not on the surface related, but I know he will tie them all together for us in the custom clothing sales private club manager, car salesman, and it's just been, uh, I know, a fascinating journey for him. And I'm really excited today because he has recently released his brand new book, and we're going to be talking about that because it's very relevant for my listeners. It's called Profiling for Profit, What Crossed Arms Don't Tell You, and Mastering the Art of Observation. So Terry, hold up your book for those that are watching this on the video. Yes, there you go. And we'll be looking at that in more detail. Before we go into some of the specifics around the book, I would love for you to talk a little bit about this very interesting and diversified journey you have had in your life. Well, thank you, Meredith. And wow, what, a, what an intro. Very nice, very, very nice indeed. Well, it's true. We met on LinkedIn, um, just responding to comments on, on other connections that we were mutually connected to. And pretty soon we're on Zoom because, you know, electronic, that's in my world, and we'll go into that. Um, online, you know, the most personal way to do it is right here on Zoom, you know, or a Skype or what, whatever. So, uh, yeah, it was fun. And we just connected, just boom, we were there, uh, best friends just immediately. And so that's been very, very cool. Uh, so who is this guy? And what does Earthwind mean? Well, I was born and raised to believe I was fourth generation Irish American white boy. Okay, and it's suddenly at age 45, I was informed that I'm Chickamauga Indian, Native American. So that was kind of interesting. So I looked into what that meant and contacted the tribe. The tribe brought me in as an elder and, and um, gave me a tribal name and a spirit name and all those types of things that, that are native, indigenous. And uh, that's another book. So we'll go into that on another day. But growing out of, uh, I grew up from humble beginnings and we traveled a lot uh, with my dad because he worked construction, you know, various kinds of construction. So after high school, my grades just weren't there. And, and so college was out. It was still Vietnam though. So I needed to be doing something. So I, I had a, a, an acquaintance that lived two doors down from me at the time who was a retired Navy man, single. Uh, he was a very old man, 38 years old, <laughs> uh, 
to me at 18, he was an old guy. But anyway, uh, he had a fascinating life. And uh, he had one of those jobs in the Navy where he stayed at sea more than, than on shore duty. And he used to tell me about that. And him and I would watch old, old Victory at Sea movies on Saturday afternoon together. It was fun. And so I, there was no doubt I was going to be a sailor and I was going to see the world. So as soon as I graduated, I was a recruiter's dream. I walked in with all the paperwork, including my high school diploma, and said, I want to be a sailor. When can I go? And the guy said, asked me two or three questions. and said, I don't care. I can leave tomorrow. I, you know. I have no police record. I don't have anything, right? So let's do this. He says, sit down, son. Let's start doing paperwork. So that's about the way it went. 20 years later, that was my deal. I wanted to stay in for 20 years. And that's when I said goodbye to the Navy and walked out and started a journey. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I was. Um, you know, I, just in my book, I go over... Um, you know, just before I got out, I got a job in a, a family clothing store. And I, I had no idea about clothes or color coordinations or anything. My, my then wife um, picked out everything that wasn't a colored t-shirt and a pair of jeans. Everything else she did, including dressing me and tying my tie. I had no clue. And so here I am, I get this part-time job to prepare to get out of the Navy. And I come home, tell my wife what I'm doing. And she just shook her head. She says, you did what? I said, well, I can learn. I'm pretty smart. And uh, she says, well, good luck with that. So uh, I did have good luck with that. And, and, you know, going back into the Navy days, it was very cool because I've been a, a people watcher all my life. I love to watch people. So when I get uh, in, into port and overseas and stuff, I would get off as soon as I can and go sit in sidewalk cafes and watch people. It was fascinating, especially people overseas. And, you know, after a while, I noticed that they did certain things. So I paid attention to that and not really knowing why at the time. Uh, after my, my time in the Navy, I did various things. The, the, I was a country club manager and a city club manager in private clubs. Uh, when I got out of the Navy, uh, I, just before I got out, I went to work for a, a men's haberdashery and learned custom clothing uh, just before I got out. So I did that for a few years. And in the book, there's some fabulous stories about that. And so I became very good at color coordination and putting fabrics together and all of that. And the way I learned that is, is I just watching people. So... When I would sell clothes, when I first started, I would put a tie on there. It was roughly, I, I roughly knew that it went with a suit. And I'd watch the person. If they reacted positively, I'd say, let's consider that. If they went, mm, I don't know, I'd throw it off to the side. So I learned by doing that, by watching the people's buy signs. And when I went into Navy recruiting, I taught my people how to watch those, for those buy signs when they were sitting talking to people. Uh, what, what types of things do they do other than obvious things to, to, uh, that, that would indicate that they're ready to join? So all the way through my, my adult life, I, I paid more attention and more attention, and, and still not knowing why, uh, about how people moved and how they acted. So when I was in the private club management business, I taught my staff how to read people. When they're sitting at the table, if they're all laughing and chatting, don't bother them. They start to get quiet or their facial expressions change, figure out if it's time to get them some food. And if it's not, figure something out. So they became very good at that. And in private clubs, when you spend a lot of money just to walk in the front door and spend a lot more money for a cup of coffee, you want service. And so that's what I taught them. I won many awards in the Navy. Uh, for, for what we did and how we did it. And one of the things that, that is very common about a, a myth about military recruiters, we're all liars. We're not. You know, there's so much that you can tell people that's, that's the truth. Why go to a lie? You know, this is a fabulous, fabulous life. There's a lot of careers, opportunities. And it's the person who joins the military, it's up to them to take advantage of, but we can't do that for them. So there's a lot of bad-mouthing about that. 
But that has been my life uh, in a very short way. But it's, again, it's in the book, Profile for Profit. Mm -hmm. And um, so do you want me to go ahead and, and talk about how I got into the repetitive behavior? You want to wait a little bit? Uh, let's, let's talk about uh, the title of your book, okay. which is about profiling for profit. Because... The word profiling can be a trigger, I think, for some folks these days when we think about racial profiling. But what you mean by it is quite uh, innocuous and actually quite um, educational. And I think that it can really open people's eyes. So before we go into detail about some of the specific points you make in your book, I'd like us to start with just a common definition of what that means. Profiling um, gets a lot of bad publicity, and that was a good example, uh, Meredith. But profiling is the observation of people, uh, what they're doing. And, and I teach you about the nuances of movement, you know, and we'll talk in a little bit about the guy with the, in, in the sports coat with his arms crossed. I sold uh, a gentleman who was doing that very thing, uh, a $2,000 custom suit, and We'll go into that in just a minute. But profiling is looking at the whole person from a point of observation. It has nothing to do with the religion or, or anything like that. It's the person. What are they doing? What are they not doing? How are they moving? What does that mean to the type of product or service that, that you may have for them and their openness to, to listen to you? So that's really what profiling in this context is all about. Mm -hmm. which is part of, I guess you would call it your people watching skills mm -hmm. because you did so much of that over the years. Yeah. It, it, it came to, I think you're drawing some conclusions based on what you observed, what kind of questions you asked sort of to check out whether you were reading them properly. And I think this would be a great time to talk about the crossed arms and you know, how most people think that means someone is closed, it's a negative, and yet you have a wonderful example, and that it would be a perfect time for you to talk about that specific uh, instance with Love that to. gentleman. Love to. That, that's the name of the book, right? Um, crossed arms is a learned experience. You know, when we did something wrong as a child, our parents, what do you do? Or your teacher. What is that? You know, that is a negative connotation. Now, in other people, it can be very innocent. I'm kind of cold. I'm listening to you, but I'm kind of cold. So um, to an untrained person, that person who's sitting, standing in front of you or sitting across from you with their arms crossed, um, send a, re a learned response to, to heavy thinking, or maybe they're not engaged in your conversation. But there's other things that are going on. Now, in my book, I talk about that $2,000 suit sale. The guy was in front of me, and he's standing like this. His feet were parallel to me. His arms were crossed, but his head was tilted to the left. And I stopped my presentation halfway through, and I said, so how do you want to pay for your new suit? And he undoes it, and, and he says, uh, you take Visa, right? And I go, yeah. So have a seat and let's take a deposit. We start doing the paperwork. And this guy is a very high-end successful sales person. I was in Minneapolis then who traveled all over the nation to make multi-million dollar sales. I mean, this guy was really successful. And all of a sudden he goes, wait a minute, I'm a salesman. I was giving you no buy. How did you know I was ready to buy my suit? So I explained it to him and he goes, really? I'll be done. Okay, so he went right back in and, and I made him a custom suit that was to die for and it fit perfectly. And that's really where, uh, so what did I mean by left? If you, if you take a center line across the human's um, torso, anything left of center line is heart, love, trust, uh, confidence, all of those types of things. If you've ever noticed a mother pick up a baby, who may be crying or anything like that, where does that baby go? Right over the top of her heart. So what does that represent? What happens when that happens? 
the heart energy between the mother and the child connect. And there's that nurturing and the child remembers that. And so the, the mother will also turn to the left nurture. Okay. I learned that watching um, different people and I'm the father uh, doing the same thing with my daughter and her mom, you know? And so I learned that anything left to center line was a good thing as a buy sign. It's trust. They're listening to you and they believe you. Anything from that center line, right? The best examples in my book about the Roman army. If you were a left-handed uh, person about to come into the Roman army, they taught you how to put a sword in your right hand, never your left. Because the left is deflection and protection and staying right and distrust, all of those right featured things. Now you get a couple thousand warriors standing side by side. You can't have some of them with their sword in one hand and some in the other. It just doesn't work. People get, they kill each other rather than the enemy. So that's where those types of things came from. And so left of center is, is a good thing. Right of center is not so good thing. So that's really what are some of the fine. what are some of the meanings of the right when somebody's leaning to the right? What how do you interpret that? Right. Well, let's take the guy that's crossed. Okay. Okay. I'm listening. I'm trusting. I might have a question, but right now I'm with you. However, if I'm going like this, I'm going. I'm not getting it. I'm not sure. I'm buying what you're saying. For people who are just listening and not watching, what you're doing is you're leaning your head to the right now. Now it's to the right, yes. Uh -huh. I said right hand, left hand. That's why the, I'd be sure to uh, put the pocket square in the left side so you had a reference for you that are watching in. And uh, so the right side um, is, is no buy, is um, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the person doesn't trust what you're saying. They're just not bought into what it is that you're saying. So they may have more questions or in a very rare instance, that's why we, we check all of the nuances of the body. In a very rare instance, do they say, you know, well, you know, I kind of get it, but uh, they're, they're close to buying, but they're still right. So we honor the right side of the body. There are certain things with fight, flight, or freeze with feet. Uh, that we can't do today, but uh, it's in the book. And, and so that's how the left and the right side of the body are very, very important. So when you think about, if you're talking to someone and let's say it's a sales situation mm -hmm. and you're detecting someone is leaning their head to the right, mm -hmm. are there things you can say or do that will help move them to be more open and, and I, I don't want to say less close, but they're not ready at that point right. is what you're saying. If they're, if they're leaning their head to the right, they're not ready. So what can you do or say to help them shift more to the left? Right. You ask them a simple question. It's in the book. Does that make sense? It's a yes or no response. If it's yes, they'll shift back to the left because they're, re they're regaining you. If it's no, they'll say why. Um, and, and so uh, we use that also as a trial close or a temperature check. Does that make sense? 99% of the time, the person's going to say yes. Uh, but on those rare occasions that they say no, you know where you're at. Okay, they say no. Okay, you have obviously have a question. What's your question? What can I answer for you? Well, you're going kind of fast. Can you slow down a little bit? I'm, you know, uh, some people are naturally introverted. And so they're not going to interrupt you. They're just going to keep going back and back and back. And pretty soon you're going, see it. When they were totally with you and, and, and open to buy whatever it was, uh, or, or just making that connection. And so stopping and, and just asking a simple question, does that make sense? Has two things um, in the sales process. It gets the, the prospective person to used to saying yes out loud. In their own voice okay uh, and what, later on when you're closing it becomes easier for them to enunciate the word yes then I don't know maybe but they've said yes five or five times their ears hear it there's that connection there that makes it easier for them to actually say yes does that make sense 
Right. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so let's look at some situations that people will find themselves in. My listeners are entrepreneurs in one form or another, consultants, coaches. So they're in going to be attending networking events. They're going to be in one-on-one -on -one or group meetings with prospective clients. So let's go to a networking event. What are some tips that you could share about how they could, you know, kind of scope out the room and determine who might be open to having a conversation with them? Who should they approach? Great, great, great question. In a book, I, I talk about that. And what I, I start out by saying, uh, start with the restroom. Go to the restroom, even if you don't need it. Check how you look. Uh, is there lunch in your teeth? Is your, is, your, is your mouth sour? You know, those are things that, that can affect it. And then whether there's people in there or not, assume the Superman or Superwoman pose for a moment and gain that, I'm here, I've got this, I'm, I'm ready. So that when you do step into the room, you hesitate for just a moment to announce your presence physically. Okay, it's not an egoic thing, so don't misunderstand that. All you're doing is putting yourself into the room so you can now navigate where, where you feel like you need to navigate. In the book also, I talk about closed groups versus open groups. Uh, if you come into a room and uh, as you uh, quickly scan the room for people you may know or something like that, or uh, dress similar to you that you could have a, an opening conversation with. You're checking very quickly for open and closed groups, but you're also doing something else. Who noticed you the moment you walked in the room for more than just a glance? Somebody who looked at you for about a second or more, there's interest there, whether it's energetic or, or, or whatever. So there's a possibility. And that person, when you get near them, will probably open from a up a closed group to include you because there is an interest and they don't know why um, at the time. So as you learn what groups that is easy to approach because the way their feet are standing or their hips are or how they're engaged, like you and I could be having a conversation right now. We're both uh, parallel to each other that and we're talking to each other. We've really closed uh, the opportunity for somebody else to come in. But if we're open, either way, uh, where where the, there is the opportunity for somebody to walk up and, and uh, introduce themselves, that's an open group. Uh, so two or more can create an open group. And I, I have some nice drawings in the, in the book that shows uh, three different types of groups and why. Uh, you may not have noticed at the first, but by reading the book, you go, ah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. One of the people that reviewed my book, one of my practitioners, said that was killer exercise to do the groups. And she went to a, a meetup she doesn't normally go to just so she could try it out. And she got back to me and says, it works. <laughs> well, you know, that's such a good point because uh, we don't learn this kind of thing anywhere else. And mm -hmm. having been able to get a preview copy of your book, I found that really fascinating because I have to say, I couldn't remember you know, in other groups that I've gone to ever paying attention to some of the body language that you described there about how to tell if this group would be open to having you approach versus others. And we've all been in those social situations where we see these various groups already established and wonder, which one should I try to, you know, mingle into uh, that that I could, you know, be a participant in. So we won't give away all the details of what you describe in the book, but I do think that that is very powerful because it gives you more of a intentionality when you walk into a room to be able to um, have a purpose about what you're looking for and how to detect the, the kind of groups that would welcome you versus would not. And then you're left feeling kind of foolish <laughs> that you're trying to move into a group that's really not open to having you. Let's look at then these, um, 
one-on-one -on -one conversations. You've given a couple of really good examples of, of things to look for, but what else in this whole context of observing so that you're creating kind of profiling what's going on here, what are some other tips that you might share when we're in a meeting with someone to get clues about when they're open, ready for us to ask a question about them doing business with us or when they're not? Mm -hmm. uh, let's say you're both seated, having coffee at Starbucks or something, okay? What are the signs of, of a person sitting similar to what I'm doing right now and you and I talking were some buy signs. Obviously, the left side is, is good. If they're agreeing with a lot of what you're doing, they're already in the yes process. And while they're responding and, and you give them that, does that make sense? So they'll say yes, uh, part of your presentation. And you should build it in to uh, three to five times through a presentation. Does that make sense? Even in a group, does that make sense? Everybody go, ah, ah, okay. Um, and so, you get them used to doing that. There are other things too, like mm -hmm, anything left is a worker, you know? Anything right, mm, got a question. Okay, you look like you have a question, what is it? Just because it's right, you read, I got a question. Well, yeah, I do. I did that once and it didn't turn out so well. So, okay, so tell me more about what didn't turn out so well and let's see what my company can do about that. Right, so you, you turn um, the little things that they do. If somebody, here's a good one, um, even in dating, for those you guys want a little clue, if somebody's always looking off, okay, they're not clued in. That's a no buy. It doesn't matter where their head is or anything like that. If they are not engaging you, it's a no go. Now there's exceptions and it's in the book. The Japanese won't look you in the eye. It's disrespectful. They'll glance at your eyes and then they'll, they'll uh, nod. Uh, um, some people talk very fast when they're, when they're nervous. Other cultures, Latinos, Asians, they talk fast all the time. That is their cadence. So you, you accept that cadence for whatever else they're doing. Um, you know, if, if you're talking to somebody and you're both standing, for instance, and they start moving even just a little bit, um, and, and I recommend in the book that you look off to the side, quickly look down, and then come back up. You're checking out their feet for fight or flight. Are they about to take off somewhere? Because that has been since cavemen, okay? Um, that indicates uh, that the, this presentation or this conversation may be over. So asking, does that make sense, may or may not work. However, and I put it in the book, if you just speak silent for about two seconds, and say, you look like you have a question. What's your question? Boom. Silence is way louder than any, boy, any voice there is, okay? So that is a key thing. And it identifies you as a caring human being. You know, I'm gonna be quiet for a second here. I'm not gonna ask you, are you all right? But I am gonna ask you if you have a question because I think you do, all right? Now this is, I'm 66 years old. This is 40 plus years of, of experience going into this five year long project. Uh, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, but a lot of this uh, came about when we started the repetitive behavior cellular regression. Well, why don't you go ahead and talk a little bit about that connection? I think that would be very helpful. Well, back in 2009, uh, my life wasn't going too well. Uh, 57 years old and uh, couldn't buy a job of any kind. Um, I went up on one day, I was just done. Perfectly calm. This is it. I'm My daughter, hopefully she'll forgive me. I went up to the top of the 28 story condo building that I was living in and stood on the edge of the roof. One more step and that was it. I wasn't crying. I wasn't upset. I was perfectly calm. Now, folks, you can call this anything you want, but I swear I heard somebody behind me say, turn around, I have work for you. And I did, and there was nobody there. I did, I crawled back over that retainer and I never went back on that roof again. And within about three or four months, uh, 
what we now call repetitive behavior cellular regression was born. And that came from uh, helping somebody right here on, uh, on, on this platform, a, a Skype actually. Um, in, uh, I was in Minneapolis and uh, she was in Australia. And I was helping her as a Stephen minister, that's a crisis ministry. And um, I got this hunch um, to ask her to close her eyes and tell her what, uh, ask her what does she smell. Smell is the number one driver for memory, uh, synchronization of memory recall, okay? More people trigger or have reactions to smells or perceived smells than any other of the five senses. So she closed her eyes and she immediately opened them and she said, oh my God, I smell gas. And I, I said, okay, let's qualify that. Do you smell gasoline, diesel? No, natural gas, there must be a fire. And this is an all electric building. And I go, okay, something tells me that's, do you smell it now? Uh, no, good. Let's try something. Close your eyes. And the, re the reason why I close your eyes is I know that if you close your eyes, you shut off all movement and, and close down your mind to be more present when you close your eyes because you're not looking at the wall or painting or the other person. And I said, let me ask you, see if you can smell that smell again. And she says, I do. I said, good, keep your eyes closed. Go back to a memory where you smell that. And she did. So over the course of about two and a half months, three to five hours a week, what we now call the CR process was created, where a person goes back to a memory um, in early childhood, but when they, on their way back there, when they go to a memory, if you're going to psychotherapy or anything like that, you're talking about the story of a memory that's bothering you and all that kind of stuff. We don't go there. We don't address that memory at all. PTSD memories, uh, anything like that. And so by asking a very specific inventory of their five senses in each of three um, memories that they go back to in random order, um, when they get to the memory, they tell us they first freeze frame it into a photograph. So there's no motion. If there's no motion, there's no emotion. Mm -hmm. There's no emotion, no ego asking questions. It's perf perfectly calm and present. So then we go through the sequence and then we go back to it farther back in time. And then ultimately we'll find, help them find an amnesic memory in their early childhood where a significant emotional event occurred. And there has been all kinds of those. So we won't go into any specific one. But the key here is, Meredith, when they get there, it's like it happened two minutes ago. Perfect, complete recall of the memory. They can smell things in that memory. They, they, they totally relate to the memory. And most importantly, they see the face of the person who created this event. Okay? Or the people whose actions created the event. Because sometimes a little kid before pre-language will see something, mom and dad fighting, or, or it could be anything, uh, a dog getting run over in the front yard, right? And they react to it, but they don't know how to re tell mom and dad because they don't know how to talk, right? Mm -hmm. So it is a natural protection device for amnesia to create a covering or a protection around a memory. Nothing's broken there, that's, that's your brain doing its job. So when that happens, nobody knows that it happened and the kid can't tell anybody. So it just takes over and, and it becomes comfortable. Well, as we grow, we learn in the lineal sequences, A, B, C, D, F, D, one plus one is two, et cetera. So the deflection system of that amnesia becomes used to um, controlling thoughts and deflecting thoughts away from this protected memory as the child grows into adulthood. Well, what happens in adulthood is other emotional events occur, which then they, they cannot control and they can't turn off. It's a movie player that's stuck. It just keeps going. PTSD starts, um, uh, depression from many, uh, a tough childhood. Uh, can stick in, suicide ideation pops in. We do a lot of work with self-sabotage and procrastination. It's not just the, the tough ones. These are, these are tough too. I'm one of those self-sabotagers. I would, 
uh, do something, excel it beautifully at it, and then self-sabotage myself and ruin it all over and over and over again. That's what started this journey in the first place. So that's what repetitive behavior does. It helps the person go back and find what keeps the thought process of, of later on in life memories going. I hope that answered uh, the series. Oh, it does. And, and I think it really does tie in too with your whole uh, you know, parallel path here with the whole profiling because both of these are about observing people, what they're doing, how they're sitting, how they're looking, how they hold in that case. And, and we're not going to go into it now. You go into it more in the book, the, the whole thing with what people do with their feet and even their toes. Um, but in most situations, people who are in the business world, who are our listeners, are not going to be in situations with a client where they're going to be looking at their feet or their toes for a specific signal. But, but I think the overarching piece of all of this is paying attention to others and where they're coming from what you're observing, obviously in a sales situation, you're not trying to notice repetitive behaviors, but it's this whole, the, the, to me, you, one of your gifts is this ability to observe and ability to notice what's going on with someone without judging, but just paying attention to that. And I think to me, a takeaway from what we're talking about today, because that was such a profound experience you had and the amazing work you've been doing with the practitioners you've trained to use your process and then all the people that you and they have helped. Such important work gives me chills to think about what we would have lost if you had taken that step. So I'm grateful that you didn't. I'm grateful that you're here at this moment and sharing with us, um, but I think one of the key things for me is, 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 is a takeaway that we haven't really spoken, but I think is so true, is slowing down so that we can pay attention to that other person. Because so often we get preoccupied with ourselves. How do I look? How am I coming across? How am I sounding? And if instead we put the focus on the other person, to notice what they're doing. And I know in the book, you had some just great stories. I'd like you to pick one of those kind of as we're wrapping up here to share with our listeners uh, to demonstrate for them what it is you paid attention to that made a difference in the way that person responded to you and ended up buying from you. Mm -hmm. Well, the crossed arms, um, Custom closing uh, sale was was uh, quite a uh, quite a remarkable event, and it really set started to set the pace of 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 the my future. I didn't know it at the time, and uh, that was late last century. I love saying that, and um, and so um, the one of the early on, um, well, the company's been in in business since 2012. And by 2016, we were in 13 countries, 26 U.S. states, and the CR process is done in seven languages. So we've expanded quite nicely. And we do that by talking at conventions and conferences and those kinds of things, getting the word out. And um, one of my clients who I spoke about earlier, who read my book and was, was really amazed, she has um, something in there where... Her life was just fine when she went to the conference that, that she met us at. There was no issue. She was thought she was very successful, et cetera. And then she met me and there was this, there's something missing. And started really connecting with it. And um, right from the beginning, she started showing me all of the buy size, okay? All of the body movements, uh, and, and uh, shaking her head up and down and stuff like that. And at these conferences, one of the things we do, we don't sell anybody at the conference. We don't take a dime. We tell them, sign up for a uh, free call after the conference so we can have a confidential conversation. 
because it seems like to me there's something significant that you want to talk to me about. And she goes, oh my God, yes. I'm not sure how to explain it. I said, well, don't explain it here because this is a public place. So that's how the follow-up from these places is where we gain the, the confidence uh, of the person on the other line. Like I know what a person's buy sells or, or buy signs or no buy signs just by the way they talk on the phone. We get casual when we sit back. You know, we start talking casually. Uh, we'll speed up if we're really nervous. Um, or we'll slow down if we're trying hard to come up with words. Uh, that's true engagement. There's different things that we teach in the book uh, that those types of things can come about. But back to this young lady, there was always something in the, in, that she thought of in the back of her mind that just wasn't quite right. And when she talked to me, she knew there was something back there then. And so uh, we did the follow-up call and she went through the process and we found something huge when she was a baby in a crib. And uh, it has literally changed her life. She is this blossoming success story. She's got a very successful coaching business now. She travels all over the world. Uh, she's done quite well. And it all stems from this connection um, we like to say it's, it's heart to heart because when you engage somebody and you really engage, look in their eyes, you have a personal connection like you and I, we just, boom, we were there, you know, and there's no need to teach it. It's there. It's, it's, it's you, it's your heart. It's, it's who you really are, uh, that, that makes, makes the difference. And now, um, uh, she has, um, Let's see, fourth country I think she's in now where, where she helps people. Yeah, it's a great story. Uh, just a, a terrific thing. Um, you know, you were talking about toes and feet and things like that earlier. Um, when we first started this, we didn't know to do it over, over Skype or anything per se. Our first coaching clients, we did them one-to-one -one in a room. And this one lady, it was summertime, everybody's got their shoes off, right? Um, and we were in my living room. She had her eyes closed. My wife was off to the, to the side taking notes. And every time that she would talk about a grandfather, her t t baby toe would roll up onto her fourth, fourth toe as if you were to cross your fingers. And I thought that was amazing. So I thought I would test it like I did with the gas in the very beginning. So uh, I had her start talking about a grandmother. The toe went right down. And I waited a couple of minutes. I said, you've been here at, at the grandma and grandpa's lake cabin for a lot of summers. Uh, did you guys, you and grandpa ever go uh, fishing or anything like that? Oh, yeah. Grandpa and I used to go fishing all the time. That toe went right back up there. Well, when we finished it all, grandpa was not such a nice grandpa. He would put her to uh, take her down for her nap. And they'd play secret before she went to sleep. Mm -hmm. But... You know, uh, how do you get there to, to know that, you know? And other, other things have, have occurred in an otherwise perfectly calm person. One of the coolest things that I think has ever happened to us, we were in a one-to-one uh, -one situation in a, in a house in this woman's uh, living room. For the first hour, she was like a piece of stone. Nothing moved on her body. And we're going through, and she, was ha she had dangling earrings on. And... Um, we were, we were, another grandfather situation was going. Her right uh, earring remains, um, didn't move. But all of a sudden her, her left earring starts, wait a minute, right, left, I get my right, left, right. The left earring starts to move, but the other one don't. You can't do that without the other. You can't move one without the other, just don't work. And I, I pointed it out to my wife. She's going, what are you talking about? I said, the earring's moving. She didn't get it at first. But uh, I went back to grandfather, and grandfather turned out. You guys, everybody, grandfathers are good people. There's, all, there's bad people everywhere. We just happened to have a couple of examples. So let's be clear about that. But it was amazing. The nerve endings in that ear would trigger and signal movement or a reaction to this otherwise stone creature sitting there. Mm. Amazing, amazing to observe that. 
Fascinating. Well, we could, I'm sure, go on with more and more stories. We're going to need to wrap up. But as I'm thinking about our listeners and their work with clients, to me, one of the key things that is a takeaway for them is this whole thing of really paying attention to the unspoken aspects of their presence in front of you. And even over the phone, picking up on some of those subtle cues that they may not have tuned into. So what a gift, um, Terry, that you have provided us with all the learnings you've had over these many years of your life where you've been noticing, paying attention, all this people watching that you've done is now culminated in this wonderful book that you have. So yes. please tell my listeners where they can connect with you and where they can get your book. Well, you can go to amazon.com, Profiling for Profit, What Crossed Arms Don't Tell You, and uh, or uh, go to amazon.com, Terry Earthwin Nichols, you'll get there. And uh, you can buy the book there. Evolutionaryhealer.com uh, is our main website. And in there, there's various tabs for coaching. Um, our, our vision strategy roadmap is a very cool new paradigm shifter for, um, for marketing, for instance. But we also do the CR process. There's some white papers for people who really want to get into the reading of this in the CR process tab. There's a couple, three uh, white papers there as well. Evolutionaryhealer.com. Great. Thank you, Terry. I appreciate all the wisdom you've shared with us today about your own uh, journey and all the ways you've learned to apply that in interacting with other people in a very successful way now with your practice and the impact that you're having. Thank you, Meredith. This has been a true joy. Thanks for tuning in to the Strong for Performance podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com to learn how our tools can increase your impact with clients and expand your business. And while you're there, grab our free ebook, The Five Secrets to Getting Better at Anything. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell. Make it a great day.